2 Corinthians chapter 4, we will be reading beginning at verse 7 through verse 10 of chapter 5. We will be meditating on verses 6 through 10 of chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 at verse 7, listen to God's holy word. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on, on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He has prepared us for this very thing as God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home within the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We will be meditating together on verses 6 through 10. I would encourage you to keep your Bibles open, and we can follow along as we work through this together. Let us pray for the Lord's blessing. Our Father in heaven, we do thank and praise you for your holy word. Lord, you are good, you are merciful, you are kind. We pray that your word would be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And may your word, O Lord, lead us home. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we've been seeing here in 2 Corinthians that Paul is teaching us how we are to live in this world between these two stages of existence, these two realities, between now and not yet, what is and what is yet to be. And there is a tension there. We know that certain things have been fulfilled, and we know that yet many things have yet to be fulfilled. And so we often live that way we see the things that are around us, but we don't focus on them. Our attention is on the things that are unseen. We see the things that are passing, but we see, moreover, the things that are permanent, and that's where our faith rests. The future invades the present as the rising sun casts out the darkness and fills the world with light. We live as heaven is pressed into earth, the dawn of heaven breaks. And so this is of great comfort for how we're going to live our lives here below 
with our brokenness and our struggles and our trials. We do so with that faith that sees the unseen and lays claim to that. We long for heaven. That's what we saw last week in the first five verses of chapter 5, that Paul is teaching the Corinthians to long and groan for heaven, to be clothed with their heavenly dwelling. He builds on that now in the next five verses to say something even far more glorious. Not only do we long for heaven, but we long for Jesus. We long to be with our Lord. And that's what this passage is about in verses 6 through 10. Longing for our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the first point is we are going to see that we are away from the Lord. And then secondly, we are going to see that we will be at home with the Lord. And in the meantime, we aim to be pleasing to the Lord. That's our third point. So first of all, we are currently away from the Lord. Paul says in verse 6, So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We are always of good courage. Follows verse 5. The Holy Spirit has been put into our hearts as a down payment, a partial payment that's the promise of the future full payment. So the Holy Spirit is given to us as God's guarantee that heaven is ours, the future is ours with the Lord. And that means we are always of good courage. And this has been really the heart that Paul has been sharing with them already in chapter 4, verse 1. He says, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. And then he repeated that in verse 16 of chapter 4. We do not lose heart. And now he says, we are always of good courage. And he repeats that again in verse uh, eight, that we are always, we are of good courage. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ gives us courage. It gives us strength so that we don't lose heart. We know the gospel. We believe the gospel. And we allow the gospel to speak to our souls, to speak to our struggles, our sorrows, our setbacks, and our sins. We always let the gospel preach to our hearts. That's why we don't lose heart. Because the gospel is true. And Christ died for our sins. And we have everlasting life. So we endure and persevere. And we have this assurance of heaven and everlasting life. So we are always of good courage. Paul builds on that. Why can we be of good courage in the midst of this broken world, in the midst of all this sin, in the midst of all this struggle? He says, well, we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. So we do not lose heart and we are of good courage because we know something. He said this back in verse 1, for we know. Previously, he said, for example, in chapter 4, verse 7, but we have this treasure. In verse 13, we have the same spirit of faith. He has said in chapter 4, verse 18, we look. He has said previously in chapter 5, verse 4, we groan. You see, who we are defines how we are. We have these things. We know these things. We look at those things. This is who we are. And that defines how we are in this world. Orthodoxy, to speak rather technically, orthodoxy always results in orthopraxy. Right theology, truly and sincerely believed, always results in right living. This is how it works. And Paul here is going to tell us yet something else that we know. Verse 5, or chapter 5, verse 1. We know. And again now at verse 6. We know. What is it that we know? We know 
that as long as we are living in this tent, which is a body that we call our current home, as long as we're in that, we are away from the Lord. Well, what does that mean then to be away from the Lord? It certainly doesn't diminish the fact that God is always with us, that Jesus is with us. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. He said to the disciples before he left them, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. We know that Jesus came to the disciples as he comes to us by his Holy Spirit. And we know that to have the Spirit is to have the Son, just as Jesus said to the disciples in John 14, that to see the Son is to see the Father. For the Father, the Spirit, and the Son share the same divine essence. And so to have the Holy Spirit is to have the Son, and to have the Son is to have the Father. We know that Christ is with us. This is the already and the not yet. Christ Jesus is already with us, but not yet in his flesh and blood. We know this. And because we know this, that we are not yet with him in his own flesh and blood, we walk by faith and not by sight. We are currently away from the Lord in his flesh and blood, in his human person. And so we have no alternative except to walk by faith and not by sight. Faith is the blind man's dog, his, his seeing eye dog. The blind man walks not by sight, but by the sight of his guide dog. His dog sees what he doesn't see. His guide dog can take him down the street and stop at an intersection and lead him safely across, can lead him through the grocery store and bring him safely and carefully home. And so even what the guide dog is to the blind man, faith is to the believer. Faith is our guide dog. We walk by faith. Faith is something that Paul here intends to mean, not merely the act of believing, but the content of believing, the object. What is it that faith sees? Just think of yourself, just pretend that you're blind and you have this seeing eye dog and his name is faith. And what does faith see? He sees the resurrected, reigning, and returning Christ. He sees forgiveness, full pardon for all sins, past, present, and future. He sees your name written in the book of life. He sees heaven, glory, an incomparable glory, a weight of glory. He sees complete and total restoration of your soul. He sees you in heaven completely made new again. Every wound has been bound up. Every hurt has been healed. Every tear has been dried. Faith sees it all. He sees this inheritance that awaits you that's incorruptible and, and can't be destroyed or lost. Moreover, faith sees God finally and fully glorified and honored as God. Faith sees all of that. You see, we walk by faith not by sight, or what might be translated, not by appearances. This is also as faith considers the object and the content of its believing. So sight here would think of the object and the content of seeing, the things that we feel that comes to our senses, what our senses are presented with. We are presented with a world that is full of hurt. We're, we're presented with discouragement, with sickness, with illness, with loss of life. We're presented with trial and sorrow and sin. We can't walk by sight. It's too painful. Moreover, it's also unbelieving. If you look at your Bibles, you'll see here in verse 7, faith is set up in contrast to sight. Well, what's the opposite of faith? Unbelief. No faith. And so to walk by sight is to walk in unbelief. It's to believe the things that you see and hear around you as being of ultimate reality. 
These are not ultimately real. What's ultimately true is the things that I don't see physically, but the things that are unseen. Paul is really just building upon what he has already talked about in verse 18 of chapter 4. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, they're temporary. But the things that are unseen are eternal. And that's where our focus lies. We don't want to be practical unbelievers. We want to look beyond those things that we feel that touch us, that affect us day by day. We look by faith to see the Lord there in his glory, and we walk by faith. We walk by faith because we want to be with the Lord. Because we are away from the Lord, we must walk by faith until faith becomes sight. Because we know we will see him one day, we can walk by faith today. You know, if you have a loved one who goes away, goes off to war, a uh, spouse that you might be a fiance, and, and you think of that, that, that you uh, think of the girl whose husband goes off to fight World War II, and you know, you think of those movies, and, and they can continue. They can get up, they can go to school, they can bake bread, they can run the farm, they can do what they need to do because they know that one day they will see them. One day their prayer. We walk by faith because we know we will see him one day. That is not in doubt. And so we are of good courage. Paul repeats himself. Yes, we are of good courage. Courage is, is a confident boldness. It's strength. Resilience. It's a good word. Resilience something that's able to, to endure the erosion that wind and sand would create. To be able to stand against culture and sin and, and sorrow. Courage sees danger and is not afraid. Elisha said to his servant, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. We are of good courage because we see what is ultimate. Faith sees the resurrected, reigning, and returning Christ. Faith yearns for Him. Courage is the strength that you hear when faith and hope speak. It's the tone of their voice. Courage. Courage keeps you from losing heart. Keeps you from throwing in the towel and, and giving up and just throwing up your hands in despair. When courage fails, you quit. Courage keeps you going. And we have good courage. We have strong courage because though we're currently away from the Lord, we know that one day we will be with him. So we see here, secondly, we are away from the Lord, but we yearn to be at home with the Lord. Paul says, yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. This is his desire. He had the chance, he says, I would, I would rather be at home with the Lord than be here in this tent of my body, this flesh. What is it to be at home with the Lord? It's not just being with the Lord, but it's being at home with the Lord. And it's not just being home, but it's being at home with the Lord. Isn't that our faith? Isn't that our desire to be at home with the Lord? What is home? It's to be at rest with the ones you love best. This word home literally in the Greek means to be among one's people, to be at home, to be with the ones you love best. Just this last week I taught Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace class. We're in our, we were in our eighth lesson and it was all about when and how to buy a house. 
And it was all about the value of a house. And there's a, there's a spiritual value. You have a home. You have a place that's yours. It's the most comfortable place in all the world. The place where you walk through the front door and shut it behind and you kick off your shoes. And you don't have to pretend anymore. You don't have to put on a face to face the public. You can take off the mask, take off the hat, and be yourself. You rest. You're at home. It's a place of retreat from a broken world, from a world that's struggling. Our homes today are comfortable places. They're air-conditioned, and they're heated. They're warm places or cool places in the summer. We even have in our language a cliche to feel at home with. I feel at home with you means that I'm at ease with you. I'm comfortable around you. She's at home with him. We go home for Christmas. We go home for the holidays. We come home from a hard day of work. Home, to use another cliche, is where the heart is. We know that for some people, and for many people, including believers, home is not a peaceful place. For some, home is an an empty place. There's an empty seat at the table where a spouse used to sit. We know that for some people, home is a place of strife and anger. Some people don't want to come home because it's unpleasant. Hurtful words are said at home. Some children don't have a home, and some grow up in broken homes. But even the negative is a contrast to the positive. Home is supposed to be a place that's beautiful, a place that's refreshing, a place we all long to be. And Paul here says, I want to be home. Home with the Lord. You know, in the Lord's house, in his home, there's no strife. There's no hurtful words. There are no empty seats. Every single one of his chosen children will one day be there. There's no brokenness in his home. God has given believers an instinct through the Spirit, an instinct, a drive, an inner compulsion to go home. And even as we read in Psalm chapter 19, that general revelation is a a mirror to special revelation in so many different ways, but it speaks in shadows. But let's see what general revelation can teach us about going home. God has given so many different animals an inner instinct, like we think of the ducks and the geese who will fly south when the weather begins to cool. And you see them in in the sky, and they're all going south. They have this inner compass that directs them south. Have you ever wondered, why don't the geese fly north? Why don't they fly east or west? Why do they always fly south? How do they know that that's where warmer temperatures are? Even hummingbirds and monarch butterflies fly south in winter. What an amazing design. God has put this same inner compulsion in various fish as well. After a year or two years in the ocean, we'll return upstream the same rivers that they had come out of. They're going back, back home. Isn't that amazing? God has given us an instinct, an inner drive like the birds to fly home. Trials and sorrows are like the coming of winter, the things that compel us to pull up our tent pegs and head home. We want to be home, home with the Lord. And that's what's so glorious about this home. Home with the Lord refers to communion with Jesus, fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ, 
what makes heaven home is that Christ is there. If Christ were not there, heaven would not be heaven. It would not be our home. It's Christ that we, we long to be with. The desire to go home, to be with Christ, to be in his place, is not to, you think of the college student who comes home after Chris and Christmas or, or the, for the summer and walks through the front door and slouches on the couch and rips open a bag of Doritos. That's not going home. What hate makes home home is that, that Jesus Christ is there. It's coming home to him, our Lord, our friend, our older brother, our Savior, and our Master, our Teacher, our Lord, and our King. He is the source of all our joy and our happiness. He is the sun in our sky. He is the dew on our grass. He is everything. Without him, we are nothing. To be at home with the Lord forever, that must be heaven. Paul has said very similar things in Philippians chapter 1. He says, I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Brothers and sisters, my friends, do you yearn to go home? Home is where the heart is, and my heart is with Christ. We do not lose heart. We are of good courage. We walk by faith. One day our faith will be sight. We will see him and know him. Meanwhile, as we press on, we are away from the Lord, but we yearn to be with the Lord, at home with the Lord. And in the meantime, Paul says that we make it our aim to please him. You see there at verse, at verse 9, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Wherever we are, here or in heaven, whatever stage, circumstance, or situation you may find yourself in today, God's children make it their aim to please the Lord. The word their aim means to, to have it as your ambition. And part of the contrast is men of the world will make it their ambition to build their castles and, and to climb the corporate ladder and they, they work toward that and they strive toward that. And we ought to make it our aim, our ambition to please the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we as aspire to, to please him or to be pleasing to him. Paul is not saying here that he's trying to gain God's favor, that he's trying to earn Jesus' love. It's instead the following. Because Christ has loved him, he desires to please him. Spouses, you know how this works. Because wives, because your husband loves you, you make it your aim to please him. You cook his favorite dinner. You do the things that he likes to do. You make yourself pretty in front of the mirror for no other reason but to please your husband. And husbands, we do the same, don't we? Because our, our wives love us, make it our aim to please them. We say sweet things to them. We buy flowers. We tidy up around the house and try to help out where we can. We make it our aim to please them because they love us. Because Jesus died for us, he vanquished sin, Satan, and hell. He worked righteousness for us. He defeated Satan for us. He rose and ascended and is reigning in heaven for us. He's done so much for us, the things that we could never do for ourselves. 
We make it our aim to please him. We want to please him. We live with this passion. I want to please Christ. We make it our aim to please him, Paul says, meaning no one else's opinion matters like his. You struggle with peer pressure, codependency, and these type of things. Nobody else's opinion of you matters except Jesus' opinion. No one else's approval matters. Sometimes children struggle with a father or a mother who has not loved them. That is a hard cross to carry. But even that can be carried if you have Christ's approval. I make it my aim, Paul says, to be pleasing to Christ. This is what drove Paul even more than the drive to win converts or to make disciples. Paul would not alter his gospel. He would not change his methods. He would make no excuses for his weakness or for his stuttering speech. He didn't care because he lived for one thing, and that was to please the Lord Jesus Christ. He was going home. And he wanted to be found pleasing the Lord. It didn't matter what people thought of him. It didn't matter if he didn't have their approval. He labored for one ultimate thing, to please him. Because one day, he would stand before his Lord. And he wanted to hear his Lord and Savior say, well done, Paul, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He did not want to hear Christ say, what did you think you were doing? Were you What did you do with the gifts that I gave you? I gave you all of this and you squandered it. Horrible thought. We are going home and we want to make it our aim and our passion and our overriding concern in all of life to please him who has pleased us with his shed blood. He says we make it our aim to please him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, if you read your Bibles carefully, which is the only way to read your Bibles, you'll be struck at something that really kind of feels a little bit contradictory, doesn't it? Paul has said that I can't wait to go home. I want to be home with the Lord And then he says in the very same breath, and I'm going to stand before his judgment seat. And there is going to be a complete review of all my labors. And we want to say, well, Paul, are you going going to a house or to the courtroom? Is he your savior or is he your, your judge? Is he your friend or is he your your master and Lord? And Paul would be like, "Mm mm-hmm. Yes, both, both. By placing these two things side by side, we understand that these two realities are complementary and not contradictory, and together they interpret each other. Paul has shown us already in the first letter that the final judgment awaits all believers, and it will be a time of the testing and the proving of our works. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 just so we can refresh our minds. At verse 12, 1 Corinthians 3, he speaks about how we might build on the foundation of the church with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw. Each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built On the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. 
though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Well, you don't want to be one who is saved only as through fire. Our aim here on earth is to live in such a way, pleasing the Lord by faithful obedience, that our works will be proven by him to have been positive, to be of building his kingdom and not of detracting from it. Again, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 to the next chapter, verse 4 and 5, Paul here says very much the same thing. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Paul sees himself standing before the Lord and having the Lord judge his works to receive either commendation or rebuke. This is not to put in jeopardy his salvation. We are justified by faith alone. We are not saved on the basis of our works, but our works will come under God's review, the review of our Lord. And we make it our aim to please him. We have here what Paul is sharing with us, an evaluation with the review to the master's commendation given or withheld. And so we want to go home. And yet we know that we go home to the Lord, to the master of the universe, to the ruler of the wind and the waves, to the one who waded through the fires of hell and doused them with his blood. These two things are not contradictory, but are complementary. Think of the son who comes home from university. His father is going to ask him as he gives him time to take off his shoes and grab a cup of coffee and sit on the couch, and his father will look him in the eye and say, so how did you do? What's this I hear from the, your, your transcript? You failed half your classes. Father pays his tuition. Son has been partying all semester long. He's come home, and there's a review. The son might wish he hadn't come home. Appearing before the judgment seat of Christ, brothers and sisters, is only a negative thing if the Christian has been willfully negligent. You see, not even the criminal on the cross needed to fear standing before the judgment seat of Christ. He had 10 minutes of his life lived as a Christian. And in those 10 minutes, he confessed Christ to the world. There was no fear when he would see his Lord in paradise. He would get the same affirmation, well done, good, and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. And Christ knows that we are sinners. He will not scrutinize our labors like a drill sergeant who inspects his private's polished boots to see whether he can see his own reflection in them. Rather, he, he knows our hearts. And if you know his heart, then the prospect of standing before him is not something you fear, but something you are excited about. I think that's how Paul intends us to be read. We are excited to go home. And we are excited to have him review and examine our good works. It's just like this. Have you ever given your child a task to do? You've uh, told, him to, told her to clean up her bedroom. Or you, you have a son and you want him to plow the field and he plows the field, and he's happy to come back, and she's happy to come to her mom and say, Mom, see what I did? Look how straight these furrows are. We're excited. The Lord's not expecting perfection. He's expecting obedience. And the Lord is pleased, as any parent is pleased, when he sees his son or daughter do the best of their ability according to their tools and according to their age. The parent is happy. 
that the parent knows that the child's been sloughing off and cut in corners. We make it our aim to please him. Christ is looking for righteousness in our lives, holiness and godliness. He's looking for a life that is adorned with the fruit of the Spirit and filled with good works. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And for the true Christian, that is not something that they dread, but something they welcome. You know, if you've studied hard for an exam, you've done your best, your father, your mother, they know you've done your best. And, and, and you, you're, when you open up that envelope when it comes in the, the mail, you might not sh be sure if you got a 95% or an 85% or even a, a 78%, but you know you'll be happy with it, and your mom and dad will be happy with it, because you did everything that you could do. And that's what we're thinking of here. We make it our aim to please him, because we know that we will stand before his judgment seat. We will receive according to what we have done in the body, whether good or evil. This is not meant to discourage you. This is designed to encourage you to be zealous. He's not going to overlook every service that you've done. Isn't that encouraging? Like what if, you, what if your kid just goes out and does something, you didn't tell them to do it, and you don't know that they do it, and there's no praise, there's no commendation. That's discouraging. But Christ is not going to miss a single meal you cook or a sick person, a single visit you made, a single kind word you spoke, a single text, email, or card you dropped in the mail to encourage a brother or sister in Christ. Now, doesn't that encourage you? He will see it all, and he will give it his full review. Be zealous for good works. There is a warning element in here because he says whether he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We must not miss this point that there is a warning there. We are appearing before his judgment seat after all. He is sitting on a throne of judgment. Even Paul, if you follow the text of verse 11, he says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Paul's like, I want to please him. He died for me. He is Lord. There's a fear of the Lord. So Christ told many parables, didn't he? Parable of the talents. Two men put their talents to work. One man buries it in the field, gets the rebuke. Ten wise, ten virgins, five have the oil, five are foolish. Get the rebuke, they're excluded. Parable of the wedding feast. All have the wedding garments, but one slipped in without the wedding garment. Christ consistently tells parables to warn people, believers, don't be complacent. Don't think you can just slough off. Don't think that just because you're saved by grace, you can just go willy-nilly through life and everything will be okay with me. Jude speaks about believers who are at the last minute snatched like a burning log out of the fire. Nobody wants to stand before Christ and hang their head in shame because they buried their talents in their dirt. the dirt. There's a warning. Here's the thing. And here's what's so beautiful. The Lord knows your heart. He knows if you serve him in integrity. We stumble and fall and there is repentance and the forgiveness to follow. You know that we are a people defined by grace. Let us run this race with grace. Going home is not without effort. We have a kingdom of heaven on earth to build. We have people to serve. And worship needs to be rendered to God. You see, going home is not checking out. It's working towards we will receive what is due for what we have done how gracious God is how gracious God is God is going to commend you 
praise you and lavish love on you for your service, your sacrifice, what you have done in his name. And you will say to him as you look into his eyes, Lord, I am your unworthy servant. I have only done my duty. And Christ is going to say to you, no, no, it's not like that. Because whatever you did for the least of these, my brothers or sisters, you did it for me. He is personally gratified by the service you give one another. He is pleased. Let us make it our aim to be pleasing to him. He will graciously reward and shower us with blessings for what we've done for him. He will recompense us for every sacrifice and every service done in his name. And this is just what hits the ball out of the stadium because this is grace that is superlative grace. It is enough that he gave us his life. It's sufficient that he shed his blood for us. We could never have even asked for that much. But as if that wasn't enough, he promises to reward us in heaven for the things we've done, which was just our duty to do. That's grace upon grace. Grace is unfathomable. Brothers and sisters, let us make it our aim. Let us make it our passion to please him, to be pleasing to him in our conversation, thoughts, our free time, when we're on the clock, and all that we do. Let's please him. He's worthy of it. Let's go home. Let's pack our bags. Let's go home to Jesus. Amen. Father, we come before you. We come before Jesus, who is even here present in this room.